So uh, I didn't know today was uh, National Twin Day because if you look at Raleigh, what Raleigh's wearing, do you mind standing up and posing? We're wearing like the same stuff. Now I won't make our wives stand, but they're also wearing the same exact color scheme. Unplanned, I, I promise you. But that was pretty cool to see. Anyway, there was uh, one day in the summer, I was really craving ice cream. And so I drove Joanne and I to Brahms to enjoy some cool and fresh frozen ice cream on a really hot and sunny day. Now, if you've ever eaten with me, you know that I can eat pretty fast. Not as fast as Raleigh, because that man can eat. But I, I still tend to inhale my food. Soup noodles, pizzas, Korean barbecue, tacos, sushi, boba, you name it. And so when we got our ice cream, I started to munch down on my ice cream scoop. And at the corner of my eye, I see Joanne, you know, eating it very nicely, just licking it. And then I, I munch on that ice cream scoop a second time, and all of a sudden, ah, oh, what did you guys think I got? Brain freeze, yeah, brain freeze. And so I'm in pain, and I'm grabbing my head, and it's like 20-ish, 30-ish seconds, and you know what Joanne's doing? Still licking her ice cream, sitting there nonchalantly. And so I ask her, don't you care that I'm in pain? I I'm suffering. This brain freeze is, is killing me. It feels like I'm getting a knife uh, stabbed into my brain over and over and over again. And Joanne's like, huh, I thought you were just acting. Brain freezes aren't a real thing. I've never had a brain freeze. And I'm like, no, it's real. Scientifically, it's called phenopalatine ganglion neuralgia. I had to practice that. I don't even know if I said it right. And I actually didn't know that word at that time. I, I looked it up this past week. But there is a true scientific term uh, for it. And it's funny, as I was rehearsing the story to, to Joanne last night, she was still like, really? That's what a brain freeze feels like? But how many of y'all have gone through a trying time in your life and you felt so alone in it, a time where what was going on was just too much to bear? Like if you're hit with bad news in already not so good circumstances, that can be so discouraging and so dispers uh, despairing. For example, we've got um, a couple of families who moved from Taiwan uh, in the past couple of years. And for students, it's already tough as it is to deal with international transition. You just move from a different state or country, you don't really speak the language, you don't understand the culture, you don't have any friends. And then, you know, the pandemic hits. And so you're set back in, in terms of years and years of immersing yourself in a new culture. But yet, in order to survive, you've got to push yourself, force yourself to enter into that anxious work environment, school or place or people group. Talk about anxiety levels through the roof. Or you've got a family member, parent, child, who, who hasn't been acting like themselves lately. And it seems like they're struggling with various issues in their life. School or work or relationships, self-worth or faith even. And you want to be there for them. You want to help them out with whatever they're struggling with. But they don't, they don't feel comfortable opening it up to you. And so no matter what you say or what you try to do to encourage them, it doesn't seem to help lessen their burden. And that can be frustrating. Or you get the crumbling news that a loved one has cancer or tumor or depression or debilitating illness, and the prognosis doesn't bring any sort of reassurance. The only thing you find yourself asking after hearing the news is why. Did I, did I do something wrong that led to this? Now, I recognize that there are some of y'all in this room who, who can't quite relate to these uh, overwhelming feelings of despair and hopelessness. And, and I wish I could say, good for you. But the reality is that even if you've never faced such moments before, you may face something similar in the future. And don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't, I don't want to wish harm upon you. I don't, I don't hope that you suffer and and you reach the end of yourself. But I also don't want you to check out just because you've never 
experienced this or faced this before. Take this opportunity to learn and to equip yourself so that when that day comes or when that season or moment comes, you know, hey, these are some foundational truths I can lean on. But I believe for, for all of us, there is also this reality that our schedules, what we fill our time with, the commitments, the responsibilities, can often be too much to bear. Uh, we can easily fill it out with things like volunteering, uh, serving at church, sports, game, uh, tutoring, Bible studies, mentoring, etc. And catch this, none of these are inherently bad things. But we leave ourselves with zero breathing room when we pack our schedules from back to back to back. And so at the end of the day, you feel swamped and, and stressed out and overwhelmed. And you can fill your lives being with all these people and having all these commitments, yet you are one of the most loneliest people in your circles. You know, I know this to be true because Raleigh has cautioned this uh, to me at times. He jokingly or maybe seriously says, hey, you're one of the most popular people I know. I know I'm a celebrity. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But when I hear about, like, y'all students who have so much commitments in your schedules, for example, marching band, like your whole weekend is gone, my goodness. And the sad thing is, is you just get busier and busier and busier as you grow up. And so did I hit home for any of y'all when I was sharing some of these experiences? Okay, no one nodded their heads, except I see one person here. So either I'm alone in this, or I already lost you guys. But whether you felt overwhelmed because of suffering, or simply because of the busyness of life, these situations and seasons can feel like they're out of our hands. No matter how much we try to gain some sense of control, no matter how much we do, there is no getting better. And so we just resign ourselves to, to being enslaved to these feelings of hopelessness and despair and misery and anguish. And we ask God, why me? Why am I going through this in this season of life? It's too much to bear. And so what are we to do in moments or seasons that are overwhelming? What can we do to deal with and overcome these feelings of suffocation? I'm going to present a number of stories throughout our time today, but if you have your Bibles or phones, you can go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 11. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 11. And just, just leave a marker there, because we'll get there eventually, but not right up front. And so I hope to encourage you in our time today with two comforting reminders about who God is, especially during these seasons of hopelessness and feeling overwhelmed. Two encouragements that hope will give us a, a godly perspective to spark life change whenever we go through these seasons. So up front, as, as we wrestle with um, our feelings of overwhelming burden, whether it's due to immense suffering or whether it's due to immense busyness, I want to quickly address a popular misunderstanding about suffering since we are in that series. And so let me be clear first that any sort of suffering for any person is miserable and devastating. No matter how you sugarcoat it, no matter how you compare it with others, suffering sucks. And to be honest, I personally struggled a lot in writing the sermon. I would much rather write about something else other than suffering. I'd rather you know, sweep underneath the rug those difficult moments and seasons of my own life. So I'm not here to, to give you answers as to why you're give, going through your specific suffering or to theologize or to speak uh, to you from a place where I know better. Because in times of suffering, what I've come to, to learn the hard way is that we're not really interested in more knowledge. Instead, we desire comfort. We desire hope that there is someone or something out there who can save us from our suffering and to make things better. And we want people to stick it out with us through all the messiness, through all the ugliness. But sometimes, sometimes when the burden becomes too much to bear, we want that cop out. We want that easy way out. And so we grasp onto this misunderstood saying that sound good, like God won't give you more than you can handle. God won't give you more than you can handle. Let me ask you this. Is this saying true because we're Christians? 
We're people who are chosen by God, and God protects his people always. If you're a Christian, then it must mean that God's divine favor is on you, and you will be blessed for generations and generations and generations and never have to suffer beyond what you can bear. So don't worry if you're suffering. Don't be discouraged. Just have a little more faith, because God won't give you more than you can handle. If you have heard this or been raised in this, I've got to break the bubble by asking you, what is God's plan and purpose really? Is it to give riches and to give a comfortable life and and glory to the individual? Do we read that in the Bible? Does God really promise us uh, this, or or, or is it just a a good-sounding lie that we have bought into over time because it makes us feel good. It helps us to avoid the difficulties, and it affords us a passive response to cope with the suffering. Where does this Christian-esque saying really come from? So let me point your attention to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 11 through 13. Paul writes, these things happened to them, the Israelites, as examples, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. And so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now, I don't have the time to to really dig deep into this passage, but let me share with you the context of what's going on here. If you look at the preceding verses in your phones or on your Bible, Paul was encouraging the Corinthian church to remember Israel's history. Although God chose Israel to be his chosen people, in certain seasons he was not pleased with their conduct. Their hearts weren't right with him. They were caught up in idolatry and sexual immorality and in grumbling. And if you know their history, you can easily think of those moments where these came up. For example, you've got the golden calf, and they were worshiping that when Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments. Or take, for example, the incessant complaining about the same old manna they were getting every day when they were wandering in the wilderness. So what was the result of all that? A whole generation of Israelites died in their wandering and were not able to enter into the Promised Land. And so Paul exhorts the Corinthian church, I know what you're struggling with, but don't make the same mistakes that the Israelites did. Learn from their history, heed the warning for how you should conduct your life. And remember that God is faithful. He won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And so what do we do with this misunderstanding? God won't give you more than you can handle. Two things. First, recognize that this saying does not relate to suffering, but relates to temptation. God won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, that's a whole sermon in and of itself, and God gives us the the grace and the strength to resist and overcome temptation. But the second thing I want you to know is that we've got to come face to face with the reality in our own lives, in the lives of the people we, we read about in scriptures, that God does allow us to go through seasons and moments and valleys where it's just too much for us to handle. And so this leaves us with with the question, the same question that I posed earlier at the beginning of our time. What do we do or, or how do we respond? How can we be encouraged in moments that are too much to bear? And so the first reminder I have for you is be in awe of the power of God. Be in awe of the power of God, be in wonder of what he can do. Now, this may sound counterintuitive counterintuitive to us, but I believe in order for us to get through these moments of suffering or busyness, it is crucial for us to first remember who God is. And so I'm reminded of this famous story in uh, the Gospel of Mark. Jesus and the disciples are out at sea on a boat, and they're trying to get from one town to the next. And if you can picture with me, it's like this picture-perfect moment. They're out at sea, the sun is setting, you've got pinkish, purplish hues in the sky, seagulls are are flying in the air, the waves are lapping at the shore, and these boats are out in the calm sea. I'm just picturing my time in Cancun here. (laughs) 
But anyway, it's, it's been a long day, and Jesus had just finished a day's worth of teaching. And he is exhausted from teaching the crowds and is fast asleep on the boat. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, the winds pick up, and immediately a great storm passes over them. Now remember, some of these disciples, before Jesus called them, they were fishermen. And so they were trained fishermen for a lifetime, and they've been through storms before. This will be no problem for them, right? Wrong. The winds get so strong, there's seawater splashing everywhere, it's flooding up the boat, and no matter what the disciples do, they can't seem to get the water out as fast as the water is coming in. Now, have you ever played a game and you got beat so bad that you just resign yourself to take a big, fat L? You just give up. And I think that's where the disciples were at this point. Nothing they were doing were helping them in this situation. They realized that this storm was a storm they had never faced before, and they were actually fearful for their safety and their lives. This is beyond what they can bear. It was too overwhelming for them. And so they run to Jesus, who was still somehow peacefully passed out at the stern of the boat in the midst of the chaos. And with burning throats and eyes because there's seawater that got into all, all their eyes and all their mouths, they yell at Jesus, 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 wake up. Don't you care that we are perishing? We're going to drown if you don't do anything. And so Jesus stands up straight in the midst of a rocky boat, shakes off his grogginess, looks at the, the billowing waves and the roaring winds and says, Peace, be still. And the scene returns back to that picturesque sunset. And can you imagine? The waters are all calm, but here are the disciples, completely drenched in the boat, seawater all in their eyes and mouths and, and in their hair and they have their mouths wide open like who is this who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him with just a single phrase from his mouth jesus is able to turn a picture a reality of overwhelming chaos and despair and loneliness into a picture of peace and worship and witness See, the disciples weren't left alone to deal with the overpowering storm. No, instead, Jesus was with them, and he delivered them and brought shalom into their world. And they are left speechless. The disciples are left speechless, just as the winds and the waves were left speechless at the power of God. This is the God and the King that we worship, you guys whether you feel despair in and, and your overwhelming suffering or you feel hopeless and, and lonely in your overwhelming busyness, remember to be in awe of God's power. Again, the application here is not for you to go and do something, to leave these doors and, and have some sort of life change or fix some sort of habit in your life. Instead, it's just to take the time to just sit and remember and remind yourself of who God is. He's got the power, right? All right, that's enough singing for the year. But Raleigh and I, we, uh, we went to this conference uh, earlier this week along with some of our leaders and pastors. And there was this one speaker who, who shared this research by Piff and Keltner that was done on goosebumps. Y'all know what goosebumps are? Goosebumps? And so did you know that many non-human mammals get goosebumps like we do? I, I, personally, I didn't know that. I thought that it was the phenomenon that like, was dramatized in the cartoons. But it's actually real. And here's what's interesting. What separates human goosebumps from non-human mammals' goosebumps? It's the trigger. You see, many non-human mammals get goosebumps when they face a threat. For example, like our dog Miso, and she sees, I guess, a snake or something. Goosebumps. But, and, and we do too. Like, whenever we're, we're in a, a situation of threat, we get goosebumps. But what distinguishes us is that we also get goosebumps whenever we experience awe, A-W-E, awe or wonder. So this is what the research study concluded. Our culture today is awe-deprived. Over the past 50 years, people have become more individualistic, 
more self-focused, more materialistic, and less connected to others. And to reverse this trend, the research study suggests that people insist on experiencing more every day all. And as counterintuitive as this is, I believe that this study and what this research study promotes is quite applicable for us. Whenever you get hit with a wave of anxiety and you're choking up and nauseous and the tears won't stop coming down your face because you're going through more than you can handle, just sit and remember, be in awe of the power of God. If he can calm in an instant a physical storm with his words, imagine how he can bring peace and shalom into your own life when you're in the middle of an overwhelming storm. There's an account about uh, two sisters in the Gospel of Luke who had different heart postures. Neither posture was bad per se, but one of the sisters understood this invaluable lesson of taking time to experience awe. It's a story of Mary and Martha. See, there was one day when Jesus and his disciples, they came to the village of Mary and Martha. And Martha, being the hospitable woman that she was, generously opened her house for them. And she uh, got real busy with all the preparations that had to be made. Kind of like when you, have, when you know your guests are going to be over in an hour, and, your, and most of our houses aren't as clean as what we put on Instagram or what we like, them, like, we like to put them out to be. And so you're rushing around, you're stressed out, you're shoving uh, all the dirty laundry in the washing machine, all the dirty dishes in the, in the dishwasher. You're telling your kids multiple times to, to clean their rooms. You're shoving all the junk in the pantry and the closet underneath the stairs. And you're tidying up all the chairs and you're dusting the dust off the, the window sills and the fans. The list goes on and on and on. Oh, and don't forget the food. Who's going to cook the food? So you've got to do that too. And so Martha's overwhelmed by all of this serving and preparation. And the text actually says that she's distracted by all that had to be done. And so she cries out to Jesus, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the prep work and all the serving? And you know what Mary is doing? She was sitting at Jesus' feet, listening soaking in and being in awe of his words. And Jesus responds graciously to Martha's frustration and loneliness and sense of despair from the busyness in that moment of her life. Martha, you're, you're troubled and anxious about many things, but few things are necessary. Indeed, only one, Mary, has chosen what is better. Listen here, I know we've got a Taiwanese fair, a dedication service later this afternoon. I know our minds are thinking about how you're going to prep, how you're going to prepare, and all these things. I know the holiday season is just around the corner, and you've got family vacations, uh, family meals to prepare for as well. And trust me, I have felt anxiety just thinking about all the prep work that has to be done. And then at our pastoral staff retreat, we're, we're already planning for next year and all the programming, the big events that we have coming up. And none of the stuff that we're doing are, are, are sinful things. Serving God, serving others, serving in church isn't, isn't a, bad thing, a bad thing. Filling up our time with healthy commitments and responsibility is, is even good and it's encouraged. You see, Jesus doesn't re- rebuke Martha and tell her that what she's doing is evil or sinful. But when push comes to shove, do we get lost in all the busyness? Or do we make time to just sit, remember, and remind ourselves to be in awe of Christ? When push comes to shove, do we get lost? Do we lose ourselves in the busyness of life? Or instead, do we force ourselves to just sit, remember, and remind ourselves to be in awe of Christ? See, you can be the the busiest person You can serve in church, take care of your family, be a good steward of your time and resources at school or at work, have conversations with others about faith, do all these things in the name of glorifying God and still be distracted. In fact, I think Satan would be happy with your sense of distractedness and 
and being overwhelmed and the immediate response to just resign yourself to, to passivity. Eh, it's just a season of life. I'm just busy. No, we've got to push back against that and take active measures to fill our days with moments to abide in God's presence, to be in awe of who he is and to be renewed by his grace. Listen to how Paul starts off his second letter to the Corinthian church. And let me remind you about Paul. If there was ever a superlative contest in the Bible for the person who dealt with the most uh, feelings of being overwhelmed and still took the time to be in awe of God. Second to Jesus, I believe Paul would win that. And if suffering was somehow based on a, on a merit scale, which to be clear, it's not, but if it was... Paul shouldn't have had to suffer in the ways that he did. You see, Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, faultless in his obedience to the law. If I were to compare it today, it's a huge understatement, but if I were to compare it to today's terms, it's like saying he's the valedictorian who graduated and became a world-renowned doctor or judge who also loved God and loved others well. If you met the guy, you'd think that God's favor was on him. But then you read his account, his testimony of his life, and you're like, oh, I don't really know if God's favor is on him. He says, I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. And he expounds on this in greater detail. If you keep reading, he's shipwrecked, pelted with stones, and have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. If you didn't catch the memo, the guy's been in danger more times than I could count. He suffered and went through more than he could bear. And yet, listen, listen and read with me what he says with confidence. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened, why? This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again on him. We have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. The many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. And so the second reminder I have for you today, it's simple. But sometimes it's the simplest ones that are the hardest for us to live out and remember. Depend on God. Depend on God. In your moments when, when you are going through something beyond what you can bear, when you're at the end of yourself, throw your entire being on him. While it's not true that God won't give you more than you can bear, find comfort that, that he won't give you more than he can't bear. He won't give you more than he can't bear. This heavy burden was never meant for you to bear alone. See, if Christ can bear the weight of our sin and our shame on the cross, and if God can raise the dead as Paul proclaims, and God can bear all that he allows you to go through. And so cast all your cares on God, and he will sustain you. Why? Why then do we put that responsibility on ourselves, or on our achievements, or on our dreams, or on our loved ones, or on our possessions, or on our leaders, when you or them or these things can never bear the weight of that. They were never created with the purpose to handle the burden of deliverance. Let me say that again. Why do we put the burden of deliverance on, on ourselves, on others, on our possessions, on loved ones, on leaders, on achievements, on dreams, if none of us or those things were created for that purpose? See, maybe our, our lack of all culture, A-W-E, is because we've got this all backwards, no pun intended. But shouldn't we depend on the one who is deserving of all glory and deserving of our time 
to be in awe of. Yes. And his name, this one, is Jesus Christ. Don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that that God is always causing you to go through difficult seasons that are mentally overwhelming with suffering and busyness just to teach you a lesson to rely on him. I think that's really more so an observation that we can say looking back and in hindsight after having gone through those seasons. But I believe what God greatly desires from us when he allows us to go through these moments that are just too much for us to handle is our complete dependence on him. From Paul's report, dependence on God shows itself in in two ways. First, dependence on God looks like a heart filled with hope. Dependence on God looks like a heart filled with hope. Not a blind hope, but a hope in a God who calms the storm, who raises the dead, and who delivers us from our despair and our loneliness and our hopelessness again and again and again. For what God has done in the past is a testament of what, again, he will do and continue to do in the future. For example, look at the first instance of God's deliverance of mankind. You don't have to flip too far in the pages of your Bible. Genesis 2. When the first man was created, God purposed him to cultivate and take care of the Garden of Eden. But it was too much for the man to bear it on his own. And so what did God do? He created a suitable helper for him. And we see this repeat itself again and again and again all throughout the scriptures and ultimately realize in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Whenever an individual or a community cries out to God in their feeling of being overwhelmed, God is faithful to deliver them. And he will deliver you in his timing. And so have a heart filled with hope. In the 1950s, there was a study done where a dozen domesticated rats were placed into jars half filled with water to test how long they could tread water before they drowned and died of exhaustion. The average time of that study for these rats was 15 minutes. So they repeated the study again, but this time with a tweak. Just when these rats were at the point of exhaustion, the researchers lifted the rats up out of the water and for a little while gave them rest and then put them back into those jars. Do you know how long these second batch of rats lasted? Any guesses? Two hours, four hours, 60 hours. 60 hours. And do you know why? Hope. Hope. They were holding out on the hope that if they had been delivered once, surely they'd be delivered again. Now, God's not at all a cruel God to treat us like lab rats and "Ah, I just save you once and won't save you again. No, 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 no. He is jealous for his glory and our good, and so you can rest assured and trust in him, depend on him by having a heart filled with hope. Second, dependence on God looks like a life filled with prayer. Dependence on God looks like a life filled with prayer. Paul's got a whole community interceding on his behalf in prayer. And so let prayer be our first resort, not our last. Let it be our first resort. Weapon of choice, not our last. Don't let it just be an afterthought. After you put away your phone on your nightstand for the night and you put your head on your pillow like, oh wait, I I forgot to pray. And you say this quick prayer. Remember the model that, that Jesus, the Son of God, lives out for us himself throughout the busyness of his own life and his own ministry. Right? He consistently escaped that overwhelming feeling and season just to be in solitude and to pray. Remember, in the Garden of Gethsemane, just before he's betrayed and he's sent to be crucified, in what was probably his darkest moment of despair, there was so much anguish and anxiety and misery that he was sweating drops of blood and he was overwhelmed in his suffering. What does he do? He prays to his Father. You know, with all that's been going on in my own life the past four to five months, I've been convicted about my own prayer life. And I know Raleigh shares that same sentiment. 
what can we even do in our own lives, the training that we have or, or the skills that we have, or even with the lives of those around us, if we aren't devoting ourselves to a complete dependence on God through prayer, what, what are we doing? We can't do anything. You know, in the last couple of months, the youth have, the youth have taken some time out of each of our gatherings, about 10 minutes, to devote to pray for one another. And I don't know if, if y'all really cherish that time, but I do. I think it's a great joy to, to carry each other's burdens and to pray for one another. And we do this in worship service every time we gather on Sundays. And on Wednesdays, when we have Bible studies, we end with the time of prayer. If you step out in faith and, and you be bold and engage in these rhythms that are, may, may, may feel different and foreign, but if you just try it, just try it, come out to one of those things, I guarantee it can be sweet and nourishing for your soul. Praying with God, abiding in his presence, does something for us that like supernaturally, like gives us comfort and peace. And so be dependent on God by having a life filled with prayer. To close, there was a, a time in seminary uh, when I was still struggling immensely. I hadn't gotten over the bad habits I built up from college. Um, and so I struggled to be a good steward of the opportunity I had uh, to study well, to train well at school. And I was still failing a couple of my classes and not wanting to face my struggles and not wanting to, to, to face them and be honest. Um, and so I isolated myself a lot. But in, in moments of frustration and in moments of feeling overwhelmed, I just cried out to God like, why me? Out of all my peers, out of the people in my family, even in my relationship with Joanne. Why me? Why do I have to be the one who keeps falling short time again and again and again? Why me, God? Why do I keep messing up? Can't you just give me one good semester, one good year? And I didn't really get an answer. But I was brought to a place of remembrance and humility. I don't know what seasons of suffering you've been through or what seasons of busyness you're going through right now or what you may face in the future. But don't forget to force yourself to take the time to, to just be in awe of who God is and the power that he has. He has the power and he is faithful to deliver time and time again. No matter how many times it takes, he's not counting and he's not overwhelmed. He can bear it all, even when you can't bear it. So depend on God, depend on him with a heart that is filled with hope and a life that is full of prayer. Would you all pray with me? God, we find ourselves I think in a really crucial moment in history, not, not in our own individual lives, but in the history of mankind, where individualism, materialism, and just the celebration of, of self is so prevalent and dominant. And we have just lost the wonder of who you are. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit would renew that awe in us. That your spirit would remind us of all the ways that you have been faithful to us. That your spirit would reveal your word to us and show us how awesome, how powerful you are. That you can bear everything even when we can't. 
And so, Lord, I want to lift up every person here in this room and, and those who aren't able to join us on, uh, today in person. God, may we be a people, uh, an assembly that seeks and, and strives to restore that awe and wonder of you. And I pray that in these moments, when, when, when we fight for these moments, that it would uh, change our lives and change our perspective whenever we go through moments of suffering and moments of busyness. Help us, Lord, to, to, to rely on you, to depend on you, and not on ourselves. May our hearts be filled with hope. And may our lives be filled with prayer. God, we love you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. We look forward to what you will continue to do. We give you all the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name I pray.